This session, we will see about the concepts and applications of clinical pharmacokinetics. In a series of lectures, we will try to cover this topic. And as first part, we will see about absorption. Now, to see about what are we going to see in this session, we will first see what is pharmacokinetics. Then we will stick only to absorption first and take upon the factors affecting absorption. We will see about five or six factors which affect absorption and what are the applications associated with each of these factor. Now let's go into the session and see what is first pharmacokinetics. Now this is a study of absorption, distribution, Metabolism and excretion of drugs. So this involves flow process. They often give it as a mnemonic ADME: absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. In short, if you have to tell in one line, pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug. What does the body do? It first absorbs, then distributes the drugs to different organs or parts of the body, then it gets the drug gets metabolized and finally it secretes it. So all these four processes combinedly if you study which is called as pharmacokinetics. So now in this session let us see only about absorption and as we have already told in the topic we will stick only to the factors which have clinical implications and applications. We won't cover the basic pharmacological theory part of it which you can uh, read somewhere else. Right. Let's go into the factors affecting absorption. Let's take the first factor, the particle size. The particle, the size of the particle present in the oral formulation affects the absorption of the drugs. Now how is this exploited therapeutically? If the particle size is reduced, the absorption is increased. So if you reduce the size of the particle, what happens is the absorption is increased. Now for drugs which are not very much soluble or insoluble, those who have very less absorption or oral bioavailability, we have a formulation called as micro size or ultra micro size. So as the name implies, the size of the particle is very very small, micro size or still more small, micro size or some people call it as micronized. A classical example for such a formulation is the antifungal drug griseofalin. So this drug is given orally and to increase the absorption it is available as micronized or ultra micronized tablet. So this is how the factor or the point that reducing the particle size can increase the absorption is applied therapeutically or clinically. So that is the first factor the particle size. Now let's go on and see about what is the second factor which affects the absorption and how this is exploited therapeutically and clinically. The second factor is the blood supply. If the blood supply increases, the absorption increases. So this is a very simple and straightforward concept. Now let us see how this simple concept is applied therapeutically or exploited for a clinical benefit. There are two or three examples or conditions in which this point is uh, applied or made use of therapeutically. The first place where this point is applied is a classical example of hyosin transdermal patch. Now you all know that this Hyosin transdermal patch is applied 
Where is it applied? This is applied behind the pin now, isn't it right? Now, have you ever wondered why this transdermal patch of hyosin is applied behind the pinna? Usually, transdermal patches are applied either on the forearm or the front of the chest, isn't it? But here, this is one patch which is very specifically applied behind the pinna. Now, most students or many people think that because of the proximity of this size to side to the vestibular apparatus, it is applied in this pipe or the, it is applied behind the pinna. Now, this reason is absolutely wrong. This, it is applied at this side, has no connection to this proximity, right? Now, so then what is the reason? If you look into the reason of why a transdermal patch of hyosin is applied behind the pinna, now if you look into the side behind the pinna, the temperature and more importantly the blood supply at this side namely behind the pinna is more compared to the other conventional sites which are used for application of a transdermal patch. Now this facilitates a rapid absorption and thereby leading to a quicker onset of action. Now, this is used for motion sickness. So here, this is a condition we want the onset to be quick. But we also want the drug to act for a longer time. That's why we give it as a transdermal patch. So the onset is quick or fast and the action is sustained. Thereby, the uh, anticholinergic, other anticholinergic adverse effects are also reduced. So this is the reason why transdermal patch of hyosin is applied behind the pinna. So the blood supply increases the rate of absorption is exploited here for a beneficial purpose. So this is one point how this blood supply can affect absorption is made use of therapeutically. Now let us see the second condition wherein the same principle is used. Now, all of you know that for anaphylactic shock, the drug of choice is adrenaline, isn't it? Now, how is what is the route of administration of this adrenaline? We can administer intramuscularly, we can administer subcutaneously. Now, among these two routes, for a patient with anaphylactic shock, Adrenaline is preferentially administered by intramuscularly. Why? In a patient who is in shock, the peripheral blood supply is reduced. His periphery becomes cold and clammy. So if you inject the drug subcutaneously, the blood supply is low, it will not be absorbed, so the effect of drug will not take place. So that again comes to the point that Bed supply affects absorption is used here. So whenever you treat anaphylactic shock with adrenaline, please remember it should be administered intramuscularly rather than subcutaneously. So that's the second example or place where this simple point that blood supply, increasing blood supply or decreasing blood supply can reduce drug absorption is exploited. Now let's see the third example. Now, if you reduce the blood supply, the absorption or the systemic absorption can be reduced. That's what we saw. This is again exploited in a very classical example. Lignocaine we use as a local anesthetic. If we combine lignocaine with adrenaline, which is a vasoconstrictor, it can constrict the blood vessels, reduce the amount of drug which is removed from that particular site. So what happens? As a result, the duration of action of lignocaine can be increased. So so this is the third place where this simple concept is applied therapeutically. So we saw that blood supply can affect absorption by different routes and how this factor is exploited for a beneficial purpose when it comes to therapeutics.
Now let's see the third factor which affects absorption of drugs. The third factor which absorb which affects the absorption of drugs is the pH. Now we all have learned in the from the basic pharmacology that acidic drugs are better absorbed in which medium? Acidic medium, isn't it? Why? What is the reason why acidic drugs are better absorbed in acidic medium? In an acidic medium, acidic drugs are unionized. Unionized form of a drug is more lipid soluble. It can easily cross the membranes and can be very well absorbed. So acidic drugs are better absorbed in acidic medium. Now this is uh, the concept, isn't it? So this is the concept. Now let us see how this concept is translated into reality. Now let's see the reality. We will be very much surprised what happens in the reality. Now let us take an acidic drug. If I, if someone asks you, where are acidic drugs better absorbed? Is it in stomach or is it in small intestine? So if someone asks you this question, what will be your answer? You all know this principle, acidic drugs are better absorbed in acidic medium. So you will be telling that, okay, acidic drug, stomach has an acidic medium. So acidic drug should be absorbed much in the stomach. But this does not happen in the reality. What happens? Acidic drugs are actually better absorbed in small intestine rather than stomach. Now, why is this happening? What is the concept behind that? Let's have a look at it. Now, what happens in the reality? Let us see why this effect of pH is not translated into reality. Now, if you look into stomach, it has a very thick mucus covering, which prevents absorption of drugs. Now, let us see the small intestine. Small intestine, if you look into, it has lot of microvilli. This microvilli or small projections which increase the surface area of absorption and hence absorption can be increased more. Not only that, the blood supply also is more in small intestine and hence these two factors overcome the effect of pH and hence in reality acidic drugs are also better absorbed in small intestine. So please remember that even though the concept is uh, acidic drugs are better absorbed in acidic medium, in reality acidic drugs are better absorbed in small intestine rather than stomach. Now let us come to the fourth factor namely gastric motility. Now the concept is, if the gastric motility is increased, the absorption will increase, isn't it? Now, now just few minutes back we saw that the absorption of the drug, whatever it is acidic or basic, is better in small intestine. So if we bring the drug from stomach to small intestine, it can be easily absorbed. Very logically you will agree with me, isn't it right? Now, so if you increase gastric motility, absorption is always increased. Now, how are we making use of this simple concept or point when it comes to the therapeutics or how, what is the clinical implication of that? Now, let us see this drug combination paracetamol plus metaclopramide. This combination is used in a disorder called migraine. You all know that migraine is a disorder which has headache and vomiting. So to tackle the headache, we can give paracetamol. Metaclopramide, to tackle the vomiting, we can give. We know that metaclopramide is an antiemetic, it's a prokinetic, isn't it? So this is a very good combination for a patient with headache and vomiting, which happens classically in migraine. Now, apart from this, this 
metachlorpromide serves uh, one more beneficial purpose of increasing the rate of absorption and the extent of absorption of the drug paracetamol. Now, how does that happen? This metachlorpromide is a prokinetic. What do we mean by a prokinetic? Prokinetic, as the name itself tells, is a drug which increases the gastric motility. So, what happens? As gastric motility is increased, the extent or the uh, rate of absorption of, of paracetamol is increased. So, the onset of action of paracetamol starts early. That's an advantage of adding metachlorpromide. And the extent of absorption is also increased because as such in migraine there is sluggish gastric motility which is also overcome by this. So this is one point where this point that gastric motility if you increase it can increase absorption is made use of clinically. Now let's see the next factor which affects absorption. The next factor which can affect absorption of drugs is food, especially by oral route. Now, what happens? Food can do two things. It can reduce the absorption, it can increase. First, let us see about the reduction. Now, where, where does it reduce? So, it can, many drugs can reduce the absorption of food. A classical example can be amoxicillin when it is, sorry, ampicillin when it is administered along with food, the absorption of hamcidrin is very much reduced. So for such drugs, what is the clinical implication? We should either give half an hour before food or two hours after food. Now this is general. Now some drugs can be, uh, the absorption of some drugs, oral absorption of some drugs can be affected by specific food items. Example, a classical example is milk affecting the absorption of tetracycline. So milk and other dairy products can interfere with the absorption. This is an example of a particular or a specific food item affecting or reducing the absorption. So we have to instruct the patient when we prescribe tetracycline, do not drink milk or you do not use other dairy products. Now that's about food reducing. Now can food Increase the absorption, yes of course, it can do. So, what are the places it can increase the absorption and how are we making use of this uh, food increasing the absorption of uh, the absorption of the drug. Let's see, now the classical example is the fatty food can increase absorption of some drugs, example griseofalbin Albindazole. Albindazole is a very classical example of fatty food increasing the absorption. Now, how is this point applied therapeutically or how is it made use of? Albindazole can be used for two types of worm infestations. One is a luminal infestation of worm like ascariasis. Now in this condition we want more drug to be present in the lumen. So now here we know that fatty food increases the absorption. So in such conditions we have to give the drug in empty stomach. Now if the patient is suffering from a tissue infestation, say for example a hydatid disease or neurocystic sarcosis, we want more concentration attained in the tissue. We want more systemic concentration. So what do we do? Here we have to give the drug with fatty food because we don't want more drug in the lumen but we want more drug to be absorbed. So one concept but two different clinical situations. So how we use it accordingly. A very very classical example albindazole. So see the clinical condition and advise the patient accordingly whether he has to take in empty stomach or he has to take it fatty food. So this is how food can increase the absorption of 
drug and how this is exploited clinically. Now let's come to the last factor, namely the concomitant drugs. Now drugs can again like foods they can increase or decrease the absorption. Now let us first see what drugs can decrease absorption of other concomitantly administered drugs. A very very classical example is antacid. Antacid adsorbs other drugs and prevents the absorption of orally administered drugs concomitantly with it. Now you all know that antacid is not a part of physician prescribed regime anywhere for any disease or peptic ulcer, right? Now, what happens? Many times this is taken by the patient as the over-the-counter drug. So we have to instruct very clearly to the patient: please do not take antacids over the counter when you prescribe other drugs because they might not be knowing that this will absorb and prevent the absorption of other drugs. So that's the implication of this drugs. Administer concomitantly, decreasing the absorption. Now, this is this is a uh, purpose which is not desirable. Now, can drug concomitantly ad administer drug decreasing the absorption can be put this property into a beneficial use. Now, when this this we don't want, is it? This is undesirable. Antacid and other essence. Now, when this can become a beneficial, can you think about a condition or a situation in which a concomitantly administered drug prevents the systemic absorption of orally administered drug and that becomes a benefit? Yes, can you think about it? Now, we have a drug called activated charcoal. Again, this is used to in patients who are Poison, who are, who are poisoned or taken some drugs orally uh, for suicidal or for, for some poisoning. Now, this drug can absorb the drugs orally and can prevent the absorption of the drug, thereby the poisoning or the sustained ab absorption of the poison from the GIT can be reduced. So, this is how the same point or the concept is put into a beneficial use. So, that's, that's about concomitant drug. So, now to sum up, we have seen this session we stuck only to absorption and we have seen six factors which can affect absorption. We started with particle size. We saw that if we reduce the particle size, absorption can be increased and this is made use for insoluble drugs which have very less bioavailability. Classical example is griseofalvin. We second saw blood supply can affect absorption by many routes. So if we increase the blood supply, the absorption will increase or if we decrease the blood supply, the absorption will increase. We saw three uh, clinical situations in which this concept is applied. The hyacinth patch is applied behind the, back, the, uh, behind the pinna because it is uh, the site, the temperature, the blood supply is ideal for quick absorption when compared to other sites and a quick onset and a sustained effect with less ad reduced adverse effect is seen. We also saw that Adrenaline is uh, preferentially administered intramuscularly in patients with uh, anaphylactic shock because subcutaneous route, there is the peripheries so are cold and coming, blood supply is very less. We also saw that lignocaine when administered along with adrenaline can reduce, adrenaline is a vasoconstrictor, reduce the blood supply and reduce the systemic absorption thereby increasing the duration of action of lignocaine. We saw the concept of pH that acidic drugs are better absorbed in acidic medium but we went on to see that in reality even though acidic drugs should be absorbed in acidic medium, stomach has a thick mucous coat which prevents absorption whereas the small intestine has microvilli and more blood supply which favorites absorption. So we all see that in reality acidic drugs are better absorbed in small intestine rather than stomach. Then we saw about gastric motility, how we increase with paracetamol and metaclomide so that the onset of action of paracetamol increases. We saw that food scan either increase or decrease the absorption and we saw a classical example of albindazol along with fatty food. Should we give it in empty stomach or with fatty food depends upon the purpose or the clinical situation of the patient. Lastly, we saw that concomitant drugs like antacids can reduce and this 
that drugs can reduce absorption can be exploited for a beneficial purpose with activated short code. So these are some of the six factors which have good clinical implication and we have seen them. So thank you very much. If you have any doubts, please get back to us. Bye.